I'm going to start with the recording has just started. I'm going to start with the introduction. So today's speaker is a good friend of mine and a mentor uh, that we spent some. I spent some time with him at the University of Johannesburg, and he is quite the expert on iron ore. And he will be presenting on the formation of the high-grade iron ore hosted iron ores of the Northern Cape Province of South Africa. Insights Conrad, you from, just muted yourself. Insights from trace elements, iron isotopes, and hematite ages. I'm going to start with a brief biography of Bertha Smith. Uh, Bertha Smith is an associate professor at the Department of Geology at the University of Johannesburg. We studied and we was employed since 2008. His main research interests are iron and manganese in chemical sedimentary environments from both an economic and paleoenvironmental point of view. His secondary research interests include applied mineralogy and early earth bioenvironments. Hence the topic that the presentation will be based on is the formation of the high grade iron ore hosted iron ores of the Northern Cape province of South Africa, insights from trace elements, iron isotopes and hematite ages. A brief summary of this presentation will be that most of these iron ore deposits occur within the Northern Cape province of South Africa. These deposits are hosted in iron formations that has been enriched residually, either by supergene or hydrothermal processes. This presentation summarizes insights that we have gained into the timing and nature of these processes, these supergene and hydrothermal processes. This is done with the aid of lamination specific trace elements, iron isotopes, and uranium thorium neon dating of hematite. The data appear to delimiate both uh, super Conrad, Conrad, it's fine. I'll take over from there. All this, this is going to be covered in the presentation. Perfect. Thanks, Bertus. Okay. So, yeah, start, let me get going. No further ado. Um, I'm happy to get started. I hope everybody can okay. hear me well. If there's any issues, just pop a message in the chat or uh, interrupt or something like that. But I'm sure some stuff will come through in the uh, Q&A session afterwards. So good evening, everybody. Glad to see so many people present here online on Zoom for this presentation. So this is a bit of a, a train smash presentation uh, in the sense that I'm taking stuff presented at Geo Congress and then also taking stuff about to be presented at other conferences as well and, and put them together uh, for this talk. Um, so just wanna make sure, all right, great. So yeah, everybody please make sure you're just muted. Um, unless I'm muted, then please point that out. Um, so the title's been mentioned a few times and uh, also list some contributors back there, people who've been involved with the different facets of the study up to this point, which include Nick Bjorkers, Conrad de Kock, uh, he's, he's done some work here as well, Ken Farley from Caltech, Stefan Lalonde from the Oceanographic Institute in Brest, Norma and Toomey as well, which are all former MSc students of mine. So yeah, we can get going. Um, and just first up, uh, you know, just in memoriam of uh, Professor Nick Bjerkus, who passed away in January this year, who was a big influence on all of this work and without whom these things really uh, would not have been possible. Uh, Mike Wall, maybe switch off your camera. Your dinner looks very tasty. Sure, thanks, Mike. <laughs> thanks, Mike. Um, so yeah, so let's continue on. So just a bit of an introduction, I'm sure with people here from the Northern Cape GSSA, quite a few of you work on these deposits anyway. So if there's any obvious or repetitive stuff, I, I apologize, but otherwise for those who don't know that much yet, uh, let's get cracking. Okay, so iron formations, very simple definition, the chemical sedimentary rocks, uh, they form usually a marine or sea setting. And um, the iron content is usually elemental iron, about 15, 20% around there. Uh, sometimes they're banded, sometimes they're not. I know there's always people wanting to call these banded iron formations, 
but I generally prefer just to call them iron formations because there's no rule that they bound it. They can be massive, they can be granular, they can be reworked chemical sediments. So they come in quite a variety of mineralogies and textures. And what's interesting about these, they were mostly deposited prior to 1.9 billion years ago. So the earliest super, uh, um, supracrustal surface succession that we have in Isua Greenland, they've got them. Iron formations, they occur almost always in any greenstone belt. And then uh, when you start getting the first big supracrotonic marine successions, they're very abundant and very common in these successions. Um, and then, of course, we get these iron formation hosted iron ores, where you get an epigenetic post-depositional process that upgrades this iron content from approximately 30% to over 60%. Um, the only time people might have mined lower grade material is when it's highly magnetic and they can use some sort of magnetic separation technique to do an upgrade, or sometimes they also do blends of higher and lower grade material. But here in South Africa, most of these ores are very, very high grade. Also, uh, one of the biggest iron ore producers in the world, Australia, most of their iron ores also come from these iron formation hosted deposits. So essentially, on your left, you'll see what a typical iron formation should look like. And then on the right, you see what the high grade iron ores look like. So these rocks have seen some spikes, right, see uh, some serious stuff has happened. Can we get everybody on mute? Just, ah, thank you. Um, so you can see from the left and the right, some major things have happened there to these rocks. So where we are, the focus will be the Northern Cape province, uh, uh, this region. So there's like the well-known iron ore deposit, Taba Zimbi, which in the, is in the Transvaal region of the Transvaal supergroup, but we'll focus in the Griqualand West region. Um, so the Transvaal supergroup is an incredible succession for so many things you can study, very interesting carbonate successions, it straddles the great oxidation event and you get multiple iron formation units. And it's not just in one of these units, but quite a few of these iron formation units can host this high grade iron. So you can study quite a variety of high grade iron deposits in the Greek oil and West region. So with the all formation, um, you do get uh, one exceptional deposit in Nauga East which highly likely is magmatic hydrothermal, where uh, the Kuruman iron formation was upgraded by fluids that came off a carbonatite intrusion. But more generally, it's thought that these can form by supergene, top-down processes, similar to bauxite deposits that form in lateritic weathering profiles, but also by hypergene or hydrothermal processes, which are bottom-up or lateral uh, processes as well. And then you can also get plastic reworking of these high grade ores. And then you get some quite interesting conglomeratic ores in some uh, circumstances as well. So generally, here's a photo from Kolomela mine. It was the south of the Maramani Dome. Now in very simplified terms, it's thought that when you get the high grade ore sitting above oxidized iron formation, you're probably dealing with the supergene top down process. And here's a picture from Papa Zimbi where you see the high grade ore sitting below oxidized iron formation is thought to be hydrothermal or a hypergene process. And then, as I said, then localized plastic reworking can also happen. So the first study I'm going to talk about are different hematite ages that were done uh, across the Griqual and West region. This comes from four different studies that were done, three MSCs at UJ and one PhD that was done at Caltech. And it covered quite a lot of different deposits. So you can see these samples were taken from all across the region from a variety of high grade ores. And we had samples for the study from the Kalahari Manganesefield, from the Hotezal Formation, Sishin, Kumani, Biasuk, Polomela, the Volarkop Dome, and even uh, Riffen Siequivart and uh, the Roy Nako deposit at Nak Mine. Uh, which is um, sort of halfway between Posmusburg and Problerswip. So, and also to show here where you get this big unconformity called the pre or Mapedi unconformity, wherever this cuts through any iron formation in the Transvaal supergroup, you'll see high grade iron ore straddling this unconformity with uh, these clastic ores sometimes occurring above it as well. But then there was also samples taken at Bruven Sierquibart. It's a deposit that has not been mined yet. Uh, structure is very complicated. 
the beds are dipping close to vertically and are even overturned. So this deposit sits very close to the margin of the carpal craton. So some major orogenic events happened here. So this was also an interesting study. And in a lot of ways, its geology is similar to Tabazimbi. So it is thought that this is a hydrothermal deposit. So the method used here is a very interesting one, which is your uranium thorium neon uh, cr uh, chronometer. And what happens here is that in hematite, it can incorporate little bits of uranium and thorium, and then alpha decay can lead to isotopes of helium and neon. So by measuring the uranium thorium contents and the neon isotopes, uh, you can get a chronometer. It doesn't have a very high reset temperature, as you'll see in the study. It can cause some challenges. So at around 200, 250 degrees Celsius, it'll reset. Whereas helium is, uh, uh, will reset even more easily. But here, what you can do is you can do irradiation of the hematite samples and you can measure stepwise ages using helium. Uh, so you can get unroofing ages and the age of land surfaces as well. Um, this has been done, for example, in the United States and Michigan and they used high grade ores from old mines there to actually get the unroofing history and the erosional history of the region. But here we will focus on the uranium thorium neon chronometer because this is the closest we can get to the last time these either these hematites were formed or they were reset by higher temperatures. So here's a summary of the results. I'll jump straight in and you'll see you get a whole wide variety of ages and even on single deposits, you'll see that different hematites were reset at different times. And um, a lot of these ages were sort of what we were expecting. Some of them are not what we were expecting. Um, so I'll leave this up here for a second or two that you can have a look from. Belgravia, Blackrock, Sishin, Polamela, the Volarkop Dome, Humani, Biesuk, Roynaka, Bovensia, Kwebar. We got a whole bunch of them. Another drawback is that the error ranges you'll notice can be quite high. So that can be from plus minus 11 up to plus minus 100 million years. Um, so the method still probably needs quite a bit of refining and it does have its constraints. So three main hematite populations, age populations came through here. The first one at around 2 billion years. Now based on paleo mag, as well as ages from the Willifans group, um, it, the pre Hamahara unconformity, at least in the region of the Maromani Dome, is thought to be close to 2 billion years in age. So considering the error ranges here, it does appear that the first hematite in the region did form around 2 billion years ago, associated with this unconformity. Um, and then we'll talk about some of these other populations as well, but we also saw some very interesting regional trends. So to the north of the Maramani Dome, Sishin and Kumani, this two billion year age is very well represented. Whereas if you go to the southern Maramani Dome and the Volarkop Dome, it gets more complicated. And there you see these mid-range to younger ages be getting more common. Uh, in the northern Kalari manganese field, it shows both the very old and the very young ages. Whereas at Bovensia Kribar, it gives a beautiful bull's eye end of Namakwa origin, one billion year age. So we think this older age at two billion years is related to supergene enrichment along the pre Hamahara unconformity. So um, that is what one would expect for a place like Sishin. And this is sort of the models that exist there that it forms under a typical lateritic weathering profile. And a lot of it is controlled by pH, we think, although I'll go more into what might be going on with the fluid chemistry in the second half of this talk. And then this younger age uh, is very close to the age of the case Namakwa orogeny, um, where there's been well-dated event like the vessels event in the Kalahari manganese field, where that now starts at about 1.2 to 1 billion years. So some people think they were compressional, and transpressional um, erogeny and compression there. And it does seem that this has affected some of these hematite ages. Um, some of it could be uh, formational ages of where the ore deposit formed, but in some instances, it could also be overprints or even a secondary further enrichment of these ore deposits. Now this middle age, uh, so this is sort of the hydrothermal people think this is a very simplified diagram from what you sometimes see at areas like vessels in the Kalahari manganese field, where you get hydrothermal fluids coming up along faults. 
and where this intersects the manganese um, beds as well as the iron formation, you'll see high grade ore. And as you move away from these faults, the grades generally tend to decrease. But this middle age here, I said, is a bit of a can of worms. Um, so 1.7 to 1.4, um, there could be that there was an orogenic event around this time, although that's been debated quite a bit. And the opinions around this as it relates to the uh, case uh, sediments or sedimentary succession, uh, opinions they vary quite a bit. Um, but it could also be related to burial and reset due to burial. However, in that region, especially if you go away from the craton margin, you're dealing barely lower green schist facies metamorphism, and which sits round about the reset temperature of the hematite. But what is quite fascinating is how these older two billion year old ages are still preserved in the region. We initially worried that uh, due to the low reset temperature of the hematite, none of this would be seen, but it seems quite a bit of it has survived. So with conclusions of these hematite ages is that they form, Kevin, could you please mute? Thank you. Uh, with these hematite ages, they do fall between two and one billion years. So that's the good of the study and those can be linked to known geological regional events like the pri Hamakara and conformity and the kais namakwa erogeny. Uh, the bad is the large errors on these uh, ages that sometimes it can go up to 100 million years. And the low reset temperatures does make it a bit difficult because are you dealing with an ore forming event or are you dealing with a resetting event? And then, of course, the ugly is that weird age population that sits halfway between what we are feeling confident about happening in the region. So some more work needs to go in there. And probably um, one hopes that more detailed geological work, and I think it's picked up on the sediments around this age of the uh, uh, K supergroup, uh, Willy Fansu group, these units, more information on the relative timing of structural events come through. Um, but I think there's quite a few groups working on this now. So hopefully some more information will come through. So next one now is the trace elements and iron isotope work that was also done. So this was based on some of the samples taken in the previous NSCs. And here I collaborate with Stefan Lalonde and we decided, let's see what happens if we do slightly more detailed sampling, we'll do micro drilling and we'll look at the trace elements again, we'll see what the iron isotopes show. So here it's a bit more focused. So there it's only samples, mostly from uh, Sishin, uh, Columela, and then also Buven Sierkuibart is what was focused on here, as well as a couple of pristine Kuruman and Gripertown iron formation samples were also put in, drilled close to the town of Kuruman. So this was sort of the approach. We take a piece of drill core and we drill out different lamina or different zones. So in a laminated ore, we go for the denser and more porous layers. In a massive ore, we drill that out. Whereas in these brecciated ores, we'll drill clasps, lamina, and the breccia matrix as well. So trace elements were done by a solution ICPMS, whereas the iron isotope analysis was done by a solution multi-collector ICPMS as well. All these were done in Brest in France. And just to show you the ore types, a general summary, at the top left, you see the Kuruman iron formation in all its glory, where you can see all sorts of minerals in there. You see magnetite, hematite, iron-rich carbonates, quartz. There's also silicate facies where you see greenolite. Uh, tuff beds will have a little bit more stortnomalane in it. So it's quite varied in texture and mineralogy, the Kuruman iron formation which we're pretty sure is the protolith towards the deposits that are studied here, while Kuruman or a combination of the Kuruman and Greek Watan iron formations. Now, if you look, the massive ore, the laminated ore, the Breksha ore, it's 95 plus percent hematite. In the laminated ore still, you can see some original traces of the laminations from the banded iron formation, where you get denser and more porous lamina where we think the denser lamina were more iron dominated, whereas the porous lamina is probably where more silica was leached out in upgrading this ore. And then you get the breccia ore as well, where there's quite a complicated matrix and you can see high grade massive and laminated uh, breccia clasps sitting in these ores. 
So let's get to the results. So reanalysis of the Kuruman and Grikatan iron formation shows everything we've expected to see from previous study. We see very classic iron formation, rare earth yttrium signature. So with the trace elements for this talk, I'll be focusing on the rare earth elements in yttrium. So this has been studied a lot throughout history uh, or at least academic literature in the last 20 or 30 years. And you see a very strong seawater-like rare earth pattern in these iron formations with a couple of exceptions. So classic iron formation rare earth element signatures, firstly, as what we call a heavy over light rare earth element enrichment, which is typical of a seawater signature, even in modern oceans. But it has a, a positive yttrium anomaly, which is also typical of seawater. But it typically has a positive europium anomaly, which is thought to be an indication of two possible things. Um, it is highly likely it is sourced from higher hydrothermal activity in the early Earth oceans, but there's also a temporal trend in these europium anomalies decreasing in size, where you can even see it at the scale of the older Kuruman and the younger Griquatan iron formation. But generally, geochemists agree this is likely sourced from hydrothermal fluids leaching it out of oceanic crust. Also, even though it looks like it in these patterns, there are no true stearium anomalies. That's the element second from the left. No true stearium anomalies in these iron formation patterns. And that's probably because uh, stearium is redox sensitive. Um, so oxidation and reduction will mobilize it. But these oceans were probably so full of iron that iron oxidation was quite dominant. And as long as you've got iron in your system, you're going to keep cerium and manganese in solution. So we think cerium anomalies and even significant manganese deposition could only happen after the oceans have taken care of what is probably a massive dissolved iron content that was there. Now we jump into what we saw in these ores. Now there are differences, but there are also similarities. So I'll take you through this for the three deposits. Now, traditionally, it has been thought that the super gene deposits, what you do is you shift the elements on the left get shifted up and the ones on the right get shifted down. You change from a heavy over light to a light over heavy wind element enrichment. Whereas in hydrothermal ores, this pattern gets maintained where you still see a typical uh, birth-like pattern, but at higher concentrations. Um, but I think it's more complicated than that, um, except for I don't think it's a smoky gun for super gene processes. I also think that other processes could be at play as well. Um, and as usual with economic geology and all forming processes, when you start dealing with world-class deposits, um, it's often that one process is likely not always enough. Either you need a process that went on for a long time or lightning has to hit the same spot more than once. So at Cishan, we do though see uh, this wide array of rare earth in, uh, yttrium patterns. Clearly the rare earth elements have been shifted around and it's not been a uniform process. It does appear as well that the heavy rare earth elements definitely have been leached out more strongly than the light rare earth elements. You could even see it in some thin sections where when you go to the oxidized birth below the high grade or specifically at Cishan, you'll literally see phosphates dumped out in the oxidized birth. And it's usually xenotime, which is a heavy rare earth element bearing phosphate. Columella, on the other hand, there it's the shifts are not as obvious. What's also interesting here is that the rare earth elements, interesting enough, must have been mobilized. Um, these are residual deposits. That's mean if, that means if something just stays put, its concentration should increase. But at Columela, it seems that these concentrations are similar to the host birth. So that would imply rare earth elements have been moved, but they've been moved uniformly. Whereas Bruven Sierquibart shows typically what you would expect for a hydrothermal deposit, as we see at other Zimbi as well, that all the rare earth elements have mostly stayed put. So the all forming process left them there. So mostly these patterns shift up in the uh, concentrations but the patterns remain the same. Also interesting at Sishin and Kolomela, and I'll get to that now, is related to cerium anomalies. As I pointed out earlier, here in the middle, you see uh, Kuruman and Griquatan iron formation have no cerium anomalies, and all the samples from uh, Ziequibot, Riven Ziequibot, also don't show cerium anomalies. 
However, and this is quite interesting, both at Sushin and at Kolomela, you see positive and negative cerium anomalies. That means cerium has preferentially been moved around in these ore forming environments. And uh, I'll talk a bit about what that could mean. So just as a summary on these rare earth yttrium results, um, also interesting what I must mention is at the sample scale, there's no big difference. So if you look at a laminated ore or a brecciated ore, there's no big difference between laminite at the sample scale or in these brecciated ores between the matrix and the clasps. The differences we see is happening at a bigger or uh, in meters to tens to hundreds of meters scale. So if we again talk about the Kuruban and Griquatan iron formations, very typical heavy over light rays, element enrichment, positive europium anomalies, no serum anomalies. Also interesting here is that the Griquatan iron formation has a bigger heavy over light ray element enrichment and also more pronounced middle over heavy ray element enrichment as well than the Kuruma. The, sick, uh, the first one might indicate uh, better sample purity for the samples that were selected. And the second one might be related to depth of deposition, but that's still work that's uh, in progress on a variety of iron formations. So if you now look at the ores against the Kuruman iron formation, at Sishin, this light over heavy rare element um, swaps. So you get light over heavy enrichment, something big happened there with the rare earth elements. Uh, Kolomela, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, these changes are not as pronounced as you see at Sishin, uh, whereas at Bruven Sequibar, the patterns are the same. They've just been what appears to be residually pushed to higher concentrations. Um, in the Breccia ores, however, if we go back here, Brecciated ores do tend to give weirder patterns, even at Bruhan Circuit Bond. Um, then, if you also look at the sum of the rare elements in the ores versus Kuruman, at Bruhan Circuit Bond, it's higher. At Sushin, it's a mixed bag. Whereas at Kolomela, these patterns and contents are similar, um, indicating they must have been moved. Again, if they stay put, they should have been residually enriched. Europium anomalies at Bruven Circular no change. Something changed over the Europium anomalies. Europium is also redox and temperature sensitive. Something happened at Sishin, and also the Europium did, uh, made some changes at Colomela. The serum anomalies are very interesting, though, because in the Kuruman and Griquatan iron formation, you don't get them. Bruven Circular still don't show them, but you see both positive and negative anomalies developing at Sishin and Colomela. And generally in Breccia ores, serum is more enriched than uh, some of the other ore types. Now we get to the results from the iron isotopes. Now, as background for iron isotopes, the, it, it's a study where some assumptions have to be made. So essentially the normalization standard that's used here uh, or the standard they use to calibrate these basically works on the fact that uh, iron isotopes that come from oceanic crust or continental crust, originally magmatic sources, should plot at zero, which you will see here on this graph. So the only known processes that are known to fractionate these isotopes away from zero is oxidation and reduction. So if you've got a pool of dissolved iron and you start oxidizing and removing iron from that pool, the early oxidation processes will preferentially incorporate heavier isotopes. So as long as you don't fully remove that reservoir, because if you remove the whole reservoir, what you get in the sediment will be zero again. So if you only remove a portion, that portion should be shifted to heavier levels, whereas the residual that stays in solution will get shifted to lighter values or levels. Um, whereas if you've now again got say solid iron in the three plus state, when you start reducing and dissolving only a part of that, the reduction process will preferentially incorporate the lighter isotopes. So an iron reduction tends to shift the dissolved iron then to lighter values. So if you now have oxidized deposited iron at a value of zero and only a portion of that gets uh, dissolved and moved away, you'll leave the res uh, residual iron, heavier isotopes enriched, whereas the dissolved fraction that got reduced 
will incorporate lighter isotopes and give you lower values. So if you look here, there's quite a lot of literature and we reanalyzed a couple of samples from the Kuruman and Griquatan iron formation and you get a very wide range. And this is again to be expected. Um, you see these variations because you likely have it that the iron gets deposited out of the ocean water at different points, different distances from the source of the iron to the sink. So if you deposit close to the source by oxidation, you'll incorporate the heavier isotopes when you oxidize further away towards the, from the source, you'll incorporate the heavier isotopes. So you get these wide fractionations. You also see that the oxide facies tend to cluster at higher levels or heavier isotopes than the carbonate facies in these iron formations. Now for the analyzed iron ore, they fall within these ranges. You don't see anything higher or lower than the range for the protonus. So at first glance, it doesn't seem like much is going on here. But then when you look a little bit closer, so specifically at Polymela, you'll notice that the laminated ores show generally lighter isotopes than the massive ores. And when you go to Sushin, you'll see that the Breksha ores plot at lighter values than the um, laminated Ores. So it appears that more porous ore types tend to incorporate the lighter isotopes. Now, if you're sitting in an environment where your iron formation is being deposited and these isotopes have been locked in, the only way to move and refractionate these isotopes is you need, you need the solution by some level of a reductive process to take place. And the same is true for cerium as well. So at the sample scale, again, if you look at the same sample, the isotopes look very much the same. But if you look at the bigger scale between all types, some patterns are seen. Um, it doesn't fall outside the range for the protonith, but within the ore deposit, some patterns uh, occur. So at Bourbon Circuit you just don't see much evidence for iron isotope fractionation. However, Colomela and Sishin, although they plot over different ranges, like at Sishin it's a bit narrower, Colomela is wider, you'll see at Colomela laminated ores have lighter isotope than massive ores. At Sishin, the brecciated ores have lighter isotope than the laminated ores. Um, so let's now talk about this hydrate ore forming process. So there's two things that have to happen to change a very heterogeneous, interesting banded iron formation into a high grade iron ore. The first thing is you have to leach out all the silica. And these iron formations contain more silica most of the time than iron oxide. So you have to move a lot of silica away. And generally you need a highly alkaline fluid to do this. Um, whereas if you want to oxidize all your iron minerals to hematite, that means magnetite, hematite, carbonate, silicates, all of them are now hematite. And you see different textures of hematite. The hematite takes on a wide variety of pseudomorphs. There's hematite that looks like hematite, but there's hematite that looks like carbonate, hematite that looks like um, uh, magnetite, and you get hematite that looks like silicates. So all these minerals have been oxidized to hematite. So you need a highly oxidizing fluid as well. Whether it's different fluids or the same fluids, we're not sure. But also if you look at the iron formation associated with the high-grade ores, they still have their silica but all the iron minerals have been oxidized. So it also seems that the oxidizing effect is more widespread than the dissolution of silica. That seems to be more focused over uh, at least a smaller vertical scale than the oxidation of all the iron minerals. So from the rare it yttrium, what can we say? Okay, so at Titian, you, you see some things that are to be expected. At high pH and a pH of excess of 12, your heavy rare earth elements become more mobile than your light rare earth elements. So if you have a highly alkaline fluid at a pH of over 12, it will not only dissolve silica, it will also preferentially dissolve and remove heavy rare earth elements. You see the succession. Riven Sierquibart, um, it just looks like these rare earth elements in yttrium did not move. So now the question is, but you need this highly alkaline fluid to move the silica. Sure you do. But silica dissolution or the solubility of silica also does go up with temperature. So if the temperature is elevated, you don't need as high a pH. So driven circuit bar, it's possible that you're dealing with maybe an orogenic related 
hydrothermal or hydrogen process, which could move that silica at a lower pH, that likely then meant the rare earths and yttrium could just stay put, have a cocktail, enjoy the heat, and just get residually enriched. At Columella, it's a hybrid mix of these rare earths and yttrium. It's, it's not quite scission, it's not quite driven sequibar, but it also looks like all the rare earth elements got moved. So what sort of conditions would uniformly move all the rare earth elements? And I'm sorry here, but this is something still being looked into. And, uh, uh, you know, so, so put a pin in that. Uh, but columella is definitely more complicated than either scission or Bruegel circle bars. Now, what about the iron isotopes in the serial? Now, at Bruegel circle bars, you don't see any clear trends for iron isotope fractionations. You don't see serial anomalies. So here it seems that this fluid was probably higher temperature, high pH, but not as high as its scission. And it was generally just oxidized. So just went through, leached out silica, oxidized all the iron, left everything else alone. But now at scission and columella, you see this trend for some, these trends in the iron isotopes, and you see also positive and negative cerium anomalies. So at the very least, cerium has been moved. Now, when you look at iron and cerium, the relationship between them is you first oxidize iron and then you can move to cerium. But if you do it in reverse with reduction, you first reduce cerium and then iron. So it is easier to reduce cerium. So what's interesting here is that at some point you had a highly oxidizing fluid, but at some point this fluid also had to have shifted to a lower EH. EH is a measure of oxidizing potential in order to at least in some extent dissolve a bit of cerium and move it. So where it moves to, you get the positive anomaly and where it's been taken out, you get the negative anomaly. And the same with the iron isotopes, if you just move reducing enough at some point to move a little bit of iron, and we do see evidence of iron moving, you get specularite veins. There's definitely, the iron just didn't stay put, at least to some extent, there has been mobilization of iron. And how you need to do that is either reduce and oxidize again, or the fluid needs to be very acidic. And that acidity is in contrast to what you need to move the silica. So these iron ores are, are kind of, you know, they, they, they in Afrikaans you'll say it's vispotira, they send mixed messages. So it's highly likely that either the fluid was constantly evolving and changing chemistry, or it's more than one event. And of course, what we also see at the moment is these lighter iron isotopes tending to more porous ores and increases in serum content to the more porous ores does seem like there was leaching out of the more dense ores and iron and cerium was at least locally and to some extent then accumulated again, we get these breccia ores and laminated ores. So conclusions, Bruven Sequibar, everything there fits a textbook hydrothermal model. Scission, everything we can see fits a textbook supergene model. Columella, at least geologically, it appears to fit the supergene model more, and likely there were supergene processes at play. But firstly, columella, scission is just one super large giant deposit. Columella is all these smaller deposits. So um, it's likely that if you go from deposit to deposit, and as you also see in the hematite ages, the process has probably changed from the north of the Maramani down towards the southwest, as you probably move closer to where the 1.2 to 1 billion year orogenic events could have had a bigger influence. So columella uh, uh, does show potential to be a more of a hybrid deposit uh, compared to the others. Um, but what still needs to be uh, uh, better understood is why you get these rare earth yttrium contents appear to have been leached out uniformly. Um, or maybe the protolith had less rare earth yttrium in it. But from what we know of the Kuruman and Grequatan iron formations, that's probably not likely. So, so there's definitely more complicated processes at play at Columela. And uh, so that's my talk. Uh, these are the acknowledgements. Thanks to everybody there who, who gave me money and who supported me and assisted me. People at Kumba, Asmang, uh, all over the place. The Snayman family, which have repeatedly given me access to Mac. Um, 
some petrographic photos here were supplied by one of my current MSc students. And of course, the biggest thanks to Prof. Nick Bierkes, um, who uh, was my mentor and who got me started on this whole process. And I miss him every single day. And uh, yeah, so especially a big thanks to him. And uh, there we go. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope everything went clear. The slide, slides were nicely visible and that you could all hear me very nicely. So I'm happy to uh, open up for questions or comments. Thanks for the presentation. You definitely gave a good overview on the chemical part of it. And I think it's, it's going to be going to get some interesting questions. So it's open for, for questions. So Conrad, I guess you could check for people putting their hands up. Um, if everyone knows how to use the hands up function. There's some messages, but no hands up yet. Okay, we can, we can give it a few more minutes. In the meantime, I can shoot with a question. Uh, Go for it, Conrad. While, while people are thinking of questions. So we can see that you look at a map of these deposits. It sort of occurs along strike. You can uh, almost see sort of a line. Um, do you think that this paleotopography um, that could have played a role in this? I um, think do de think definitely. I, I think definitely in the Maramani Dome uh, uh, area. I mean, if you if you look at this, I'm, it's it definitely played at least some role there. Of course, uh, and I'm quickly just going to go here to this diagram which is your pre gamma on conformity. I mean, wherever that cuts uh, a, a certain sedimentary unit, something interesting happens. So there was definitely significant lateritic weathering at around 2 billion years along this unconformity. And um, so I think for some of the deposits, especially if this unconformity is cutting across in a certain line, a certain paleotopography, Yes, that will play a role. But of course, an unconformity like this could then in future after burial act as a conduit for later fluids as well. So that it also needs to be considered um, and looked at, at least in some parts or some regions of the area potentially. Um, so yeah, that's the comment I have. So I do I do think paleotopography, well, it's a big erosion on conformity just after the GOE at a time when oxygen levels probably ramped up before it went back down again. So, so the earth was quite oxidizing at that time. And if you look at where this unconformity cuts through dolerite intrusions, it looks a lot vertically like a modern lateritic weathering profile. Uh, yes, you've got a hand. Yeah, Conrad, sorry, do you have another comment? I can agree to that. I've seen it on uh, lamplifiers and gimbal lights as well. Especially on them, you, you can see that, and all the dikes. Yeah. yeah. No, there's a, we did a paper on it as well, and there's also yeah. some good papers, Dick Holland and them did back in the day as well. These, uh, uh, these, these paleosols are quite well known in the region. Uh, Jens, you have a question. Yeah, thanks, Patrice, for a great talk. Um, I've got a number of questions, but I'll start, I'll start <laughs> with the one... Um, you know, the ages, you have ages that obviously date the pre Kamahara and conformity. Mm -hmm. You have ages that date um, the, the, the late orogeny, okay, which is fine, one billion year. The, the intermediate ages, why don't you just interpret them as, as partially reset? Well, I guess, yeah, uh, but, but I, I, would, I, I still need a bit of time because these things still need proper formal writing up. So one would probably just have to have a look at the thickness of the case supergroup and see, you know, what sort of thicknesses would it have reached at those times? Uh, what would be theoretical burial depths and, and what would be temperatures as based upon uh, a, a, a conservative geothermal gradient estimate? So those are still things I need to do. Sorry, I, I somehow, oh wait, it's this, uh, when you put up your hand or do this, sometimes Zoom just, just reads it and, 
Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think Donald Trump must make this thing nuts at times with his gestures. <laughs> so, um, anyway, if I can just get the figure out uh, how to drop a little Okay, so my hand will, I guess my hand will be up now. Um, so I, I think there's some truth to what you're saying there, that you're dealing with a partial reset. But I think that also shows that um, uh, if this is not like some sort of mid-age hypergene event, that there's a lot of things not getting reset by the um, by the Kaisner macroerogeny. So I also think what is happening there is not always as homogenous as we think. I think there are some heterogeneous changes happening all along here, as you often see with structural geology. Mm. Um, so I think it could be related to structures in the area. Um, and I mean, every, any sort of hypergene reset needs a conduit, right? And, and these conduits are usually not, uh, um, they, they're usually channelized, they're focused. They won't be, um, what's the word again? Ubiquitous all over. The word's slipping out of my mind now. Anyway, Jens, did you have another question? Yeah, yeah, but let me just add that, you know, we did argon-argon dating uh, on the on the asbestos from mm. any sites uh, on the Marimani Dome and south of it. And uh, we see exactly the same pattern as you see with oh, okay. the ages. We have, we have old mm. ages, and then we have mixed ages, and then we have the youngest mm. one year age or the youngest. So uh, since we know that, these uh, must be pre Hamahara and so on, the asbestos and the related deformation. Um, I, I came to the conclusion, we never published this, but I came to the conclusion that uh, it's partially reset by low temperature fluids flowing mm. through. There. You never yeah. date one crystal, yeah. you, know, you date a lot. Yeah, yeah. So you, you either have to recrystallize the hematite or heat it above to 250 odd degrees yeah. Celsius. So I can, I can see that happening. But I, I would still like to dig a bit deeper. As you say, people, some people will make you believe there's no deformation in the area. Uh, um, so, uh, other people are saying, no, this, this. But I, but I think there's work being done, especially on the overlying succession. Um, and there's some very uh, talented structural geologists on this. And they might be able to, to get that two to one billion year history, maybe a little bit better pulled apart. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't want to too quickly, too easily go for a certain conclusion. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it's probably a case of, as you say, a combination of maybe fluids, uh, but also maybe burial reset. But I just need to do the math on that still. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the other question um, I have is a question of scale. When you look at the rare earth elements, I mean, you really mm. have very, very fine sampling. Yeah. From the mineralogy, we know that there is xenotime forming, there is monazite mm. forming, uh, mm. yeah, and also, so we have redistribution, but the question is mm. the scale, because if we take bigger samples, we don't have this variability, you know, the, the, the mm. literature data. It homogenizes, we, yeah. It homogenizes. But, but in this instance, um, you see, I mean, and that's the thing, if, if you look at the two lamina in the same sample, it's the same. What's happening is happening at a bigger scale. So, as I said, you know, for laminated or massive or, or brecciated or those group fairly closely together, but between ore types, you do start seeing the differences. And I mean, if you look at the phosphorus content of the, um, of the high grade ores, it's very low, even lower than what you see in the Kuruman and the Greek town. So, phosphorus has been, has been attacked by these processes and leached out. But, but what's weird about that is that despite that phosphorus minerals being such high carriers of rare earth yttrium, uh, uh, it does not seem that in all instances the rare earth elements in yttrium went with the, the, the phosphates. So I think it still needs quite a bit of work and understanding. I don't know, I don't know if that's okay for you, Jens, or if you have any other comments or questions. No, no, no. Uh, just, just a comment. Having a pH of 12 in a natural fluid is bloody difficult uh, so so mm. that that that's not a question that's just you need to consider this in, uh, well it, it's true not possible yeah but these things are sitting in sinkholes so there's a lot of carbonate around but, but does that makes no uh no ph12 yeah really it's really really yeah difficult. i know but, but yeah but i i had a look even the heavy rare elements you need to push a ph of 12 before you start dissolving and moving them 
Unless, of course, there's also the question of ligands, organic yes. ligands, those yeah. things. Um, and But again, we have no idea what these things were doing two billion years ago. Yeah. So um, you, you're essentially going into things, you're not exactly answering the question. You're rather coming up with scenarios yeah. and saying, if we have this, we could have do this and explain that. But if we had this, we could do this. And we could, uh, and so, so it is, is quite complicated. And I think I I'm, I'm think organic ligands, like in modern laterites, uh, they, they could have played a role. Yes. Thanks. Uh, sure, James. You're welcome. Conrad. That is a uh, comment just on the Xenotime. You also mentioned it in your presentation you, you briefly mentioned it uh, about that you do find a increase in rare earth elements at that contact or rather like a transitional zone in a weathering profile i remember yeah. at, at session we had about three samples that's close to the oxidized buff and or contact mm. and you can see how those appetites and xenotimes all those phosphates literally dropped out of solution and it's it's sitting within the matrix of the spectras so i just yeah. uh, wanted to make that comment and then i have a, had a follow i have a follow-up question on one of my earlier questions um you do find conglomeratic or all over the modern money done yeah yeah of I, course that just wasn't that just wasn't the yes. focus of this specific study I, uh, however, we, we, we wanted to keep it simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. However, you also well, you also see it at at NAC deposit. You see these conglomerates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Absolutely. I, I, haven't the seen, I haven't seen them at Zirkubar. Do you find conglomeratic or at Zirkubar at this area close to Priska? Because no, not at all. Because the Prigamagara unconformity doesn't cut through there at all. So, yeah. the, There's you, no. You get the full. Okay. You get the full stratigraphy, and it's been overturned. Um, something big happened there, and uh, Ken Farley told me, if you look at the helium age, he thinks that is a perfect place to do erosional and unroofing history on the western margin of the dome. So Grovensi Equibart is it, it's definitely quite a different deposit to what we see in Umaran today. Yeah, so okay, now that's that's sort of like a silver bullet for for that area that it can't be super gene. Because there is no conglomerate. No, 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 unless unless you get some sort of a, a deep seated fault system or something. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think some deposits, it's definitely a more complicated story than initially thought. Um, but in some deposits, at least with the information that's at hand, you know, it, it looks a bit more clear cut. And it does look like Bourbon Sequibart and Sishin are two end members uh, of these processes. Any other comments or questions? Francois. Hi, Albertus. Uh, you had a map of the location or the locality. I don't know if you can quickly um, skip to that one. If you look at the Prisca area, um, taking the hydrothermal processes you know, in, into consideration, why don't we have any iron ore deposits um, at the edge of the Kraton? Well, I, I guess that also, I mean, you ask a very good question. Um, but I mean, that's true of a lot of things. I, I mean, if you look at Tabazimbi, um, it really looks like that's hydrothermalism related to the Bushveld complex. But it formed at Tabazimbi. But there's a lot of areas of the bench in proximity to the Bushveld complex where it didn't form these high grade deposits. So it really does seem like something unique has to happen. You, I mean, if an orogenic event just formed ore deposits everywhere, we, we, we'd be mining all over these. I mean, even in, okay, there's a lot of copper in Chile, but it's not across the entire mountain range, you know, the, all of the Andes. So you ask an interesting question and it's hard to fully understand why, but it does seem, even though these are big regional processes, any ore formation associated with that does seem. And what that could be at the moment, I just don't think there's the, information at, at Riven Sierquibar. We don't know. And and maybe the ore deposit formed earlier and the one billion is a reset. Um, 
But yeah, from the information now, I think it's likely it's associated with that. But then, as you said, you mentioned Prisca, which is also getting close to the Craton edge. But then again, at Prisca, you get some of the most beautiful and most pristine uh, uh, Kuruman iron formation as well. So it's, yeah, I mean, if geology was easy, would we love it so much? Yeah, so I won't be investing in a farm in Prisca soon. Thanks, Bertis. <laughs> okay. Okay, any other questions or comments? I, I think we're getting close to running out of time. Okay, if nothing else, uh, if nothing else is coming through, everybody, you, my email address is easily available online. So if you want, if you think of anything, want to send me an email, ask any other questions, because I know sometimes you don't have a question, then maybe 2 a.m. at night you wake up and you realize you had one please feel free to mail me and then ask me any questions or to comment on the talk. I'm always very happy for that uh, sort of discussion. Um, but yeah, and, and Conrad, Loni, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the opportunity to give this talk. I, I always enjoy doing this. And thank you to the Northern Cape branch. It's good to see you guys organizing events and I'm always keen and happy to participate. Thanks, Bertus. Thanks for your time. I think it was a very successful event. I think we had almost 40, 40 attendants, which is quite good for an online event. At, at some point, but they did taper off at some point. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Bertus. Thanks so much, Thanks, Bertus. Conrad. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Bertus. Take, take care, and take I'll chat to you all later. Have okay. a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.